Good evening. I'm uh, Zadi Dito. I'm the uh, chairman of the management board of the uh, Corporate of Foreign Structure in Britain and Ireland. Obviously, I'm not the one you're here to uh, listen to, but before uh, we start, I just wanted to uh, say how much uh, the uh, corpus relies on uh, help and support from uh, everyone. We are a volunteer-led and volunteer-based uh, organization, which uh, is bringing together a database corpus of uh, structure, or from a structure, as our name uh, indicates. We've been through a few transformative years in the past, and with the uh, pandemic, we had uh, we also had a transformation of our website, so if you haven't been on, the, on our website recently, I invite you to go there and see all we uh, do with some amazing new uh, sites, like our biggest site ever, the Cathedral, Cathedral of Peterborough, which was uh, done by uh, Ron here. But uh, mostly, uh, before we start, I just wanted to remind you that we are relying on volunteers, but we also rely on uh, donations to help us uh, move forward. And that's uh, and this annual lecture is an a good opportunity for us to remind you that we also need your help in uh, that way. I know that some of our uh, donors are in the, uh, the room. Uh, some others, like John Osborne, who supported us very strongly very recently, might be, uh, may, may be online. So before we start, I just wanted to take this opportunity also to thank both our volunteers and our donor who made our uh, work uh, possible. Uh, enough about that. Uh, I will now leave the uh, floor to uh, Professor Neil Stratford, who will be uh, introducing our lecturer for tonight. Thank you very much. Professor Thank you, Thank you, Xavier. Is that, is that right? Yes, good. Um, yes, the corpus. Um, I'm here because I'm the chairman of the trustees of, of the corpus of Bremner Sculpture in, in Britain and Ireland. And um, it's a project which was officially started in the early 1980s, I think, but in fact, the genesis of it goes back much further than that, um, with uh, as a, an idea in, in the head of our, our lead lamented farmer, uh, George Donetsky. Um, I don't see any of his family here tonight, but sometimes they come to this annual lecture, um, which is always given in the court hall. Um, our lecture tonight is um, a slight break with tradition, because until this moment, we've been uh, sternly in the, in, the, in the discipline of traditional art history with um, previous lecturers. Whereas tonight, with um, Dr. Alex Woodcock, uh, we move into the realm of doing. Uh, he is uh, a stonemason and sculptor. And so I think we're going to get a very interesting and quite different sort of slant on um, the Rainer sculpture. And um, in, in particular, one of the themes of his analysis lecture is that of repetition of motifs, which are repeated um, a multitude of times, sometimes in different contexts. Um, Alex, um, um, whom I have only just met personally for the first time, but I've been uh, looking, looking him up, as it were. And um, his, his PhD thesis was, was presented in 2003 at, at Southampton University. And um, uh, I think largely published in the British Archaeological Reports in 2005 uh, with the title um, uh, liminal images, liminal Im images um, in architectural sculpture in South, South England, South of England. Um, he's written a number of books, and um, I, the ones that I would particularly mention are uh, of Sirens and Centaurs, which concerns Exeter Cathedral after 
after his uh, supernovae days, his um, submission of his thesis, he um, spent six years in the Mason's Lodge at Exeter Cathedral, working on the conservation of the sculpture of the West Front. And um, he told me that he was responsible for carving uh, one or two of the gargoyles and uh, restoring the, some of the tracery of the West Front. And he said he even uh, got involved with one of those wonderful little figures that are always intriguing, which look out over the parapet as you're approaching the, the West for summer. Nicholas Poston, by the way, always said about this extraordinary little um, motif at Exeter. The only thing he could think of which looked at all like it, apart from Selby in Yorkshire, which has something similar, was at Mulhausen in Thuringia. That shows uh, the international nature of Pevsner's eye and his knowledge. And so um, Alex published A Sirens and Centaurs on Exeter Cathedral um, in 2013, and more recently, um, with great success, a book called King of Dust, which was published in Little Toller. That's, that, that's, um, that's Burnett's um, private press, isn't it, Alex? Um, I think it's a private press, though. Oh, oh no. Yes, yes. Anyway, we, we welcome you, Alex, very much, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you um, for that uh, introduction there, Neil. Much appreciated. I'm delighted to be uh, speaking to you this evening about Romanesque sculpture and uh, extend my sincere thanks to, uh, to Ron Baxter for inviting me to talk this evening. I've been to a couple of these events before, and each time I've sat in the audience and thought, wow, I'm glad that's not me up there having to do this. <laughs> but I'm pleased to report it is a very fine place to be and I'm very honoured to have been invited. To quell my um, nagging imposter syndrome, though, I'd, and to give you some kind of introduction as to who I am and why I'm here that sort of fleshes out some of those details a bit more, I thought I'd start with a brief outline, really, of my connections with Romanesque and medieval sculpture in general. Before, oh, sorry, there's the title slide, that's the one we want. Before um, I do that, though, I want to get straight in with uh, the evening subject matter. This is the doorway uh, to the South Isle um, at Shevia in North Devon. And um, it's not well known outside of the Southwest. It's not actually that well known in the Southwest. And certainly within the broader repertoire of Romanesque sculpture, I appreciate there's nothing particularly outstanding about it other than the fact that somebody's tried to make it into a Gothic arch at some point. Nonetheless, when I first encountered this um, arch, I was really drawn to it for some reason. I really, really liked it. Um, and then tried to find material about it uh, in the literature, which is very scant. What I did find in the literature, really, um, and this is going back uh, to about 20 years when I first uh, discovered this doorway for myself, were the words identical and repetitive. And that's what I wanted to look at this evening. So in many respects I've always felt a bit disappointed by the literature surrounding this particular doorway um, and perhaps because of this I've always felt that work of this nature that's sort of been interpreted in this way and you know slightly sidelined deserves a bit more respect which I hope to do something about tonight. So as Neil uh, said my background is as an archaeologist and then as a cathedral stonemason I studied buildings archaeology initially, and then I later wrote my PhD on medieval architectural sculpture. This was back in the early years of the new millennium. But after I'd finished it, I wasn't really sure what to do or where I fitted. And I guess if you've written 100,000 words about the grotesque, you are largely going to be unemployable. <laughs> um, hindsight, as ever. So I decided to learn how to work stone. I'd seen an advert for a stone carving workshop uh, in the southwest, it was in Somerset, and I thought that after all these years of looking at it, I really should learn how to do it. And 
crucially, this particular advert showed one of the sculptor's carvings, and uh, it turned out, as I later found out, that he had a big love of Romanesque sculpture, because I could see that in his work. Anyway, so I thought I'd uh, really, truly embarrass myself this evening. I'm going to show you my first stone carving, which is that. Um, that's what I did in that afternoon's workshop um, with Nick Dernan in Somerset. And, um, and yes, it's my first piece. Funnily enough, though, and the reason I am showing this uh, to you this evening, to sort of show where I started, that's copying a, you know, a geometric pattern from a Romanesque font in Devon. So the start of my working life as a stonemason um, sort of has come from the southwest of England and the Romanesque motifs. More than that, though, that isn't one of my photographs. That's a photograph by Devon historian um, Kate Clark, who was an early writer on Romanesque fonts. So where I started as a stonemason is kind of in this world somewhere between the academic and the practical, and I've kind of occupied that zone ever since. Oh yes, that's just to show you, and uh, as stonemasons will know, don't leave things lying about, they get repurposed. It now fulfills a role underneath the water butt in the garden at my mum's house. <laughs> and, and now I do a variety of things from freelance writing to uh, teaching cathedral stonemasons um, and a bit of masonry as well. Right, so this is my plan for the evening. Very briefly, I want to introduce to you. Romanesque sculpture in the southwest, uh, Devon and Cornwall, and then dig into this idea of uh, repeated designs. Can we look at them slightly differently? Can we think about them slightly differently? And uh, what is the value of doing that? Uh, and then I want to return to the North Devon doorways and see if um, we can get more information from them by having thought about these things. Just to be abundantly clear, I'm sure everybody knows where the southwest of England is. Um, that is the southwest of England. To me, the southwest is Devon and Cornwall. Others refer to that as the far southwest. Others refer to it as West Country. This is an ongoing argument, which I don't want to dive into tonight because, you know, it runs on to this day. So why is the Romanesque in the southwest not that well known? Well, we'll see some of the broader reasons for this as we go along. But overall, I think there's no obvious big standout sites like Kilpack in Herefordshire or Barthraston in Kent. Um, figurative works are few and far between. And the material does tend to be scattered around. It's um, you know, a font here or a doorway there and so on. Which means that you do have to get out and, and really sort of seek it out. That said, when you do, there are some amazing things to find. This is the doorway at St. Germans in Cornwall. Possibly uh, you know, one of the biggest and most impressive and important sites um, because it was once the Cathedral of Cornwall uh, before it was merged with Crediton and then they became Exeter. So it continued to be an important site after the 11th century when uh, that merger happened. And we have this spectacular a uh, portal of uh, seven orders with every single variety of chevron you can imagine. It's a proper trip for the chevron enthusiasts, although very badly weathered. Um, quite a friable stone was used for that one. Perhaps the biggest concentration of uh, Romanesque work must be the north and the south towers at uh, Exeter Cathedral itself. Uh, these are on the north transept and the south transept. They're not identical, but they do have, share quite a concise range of ornamental motifs. We've got blind arcading and a very particular style of carving uh, of the corbels. Um, and you know, the impact of Exeter on the southwest can't really be overstated, I think. There are a number of sites in the region connected uh, to the 12th century bishops of Exeter that show some similarities to Exeter, such as fragments and corbels from Plimpton Priory, which is no longer standing. Again, these are pieces that uh, exist uh, in museums. And then there's the odd 
church here and there that really does show amazing work that uh, is generally connected with uh, the bishops of Exeter. So I'm going to show you a few examples of those just to give you some idea. This is uh, St. Anthony and Roseland in Cornwall, um, originally a monastic cell dependent upon Plimpton Priory, uh, which of course had connections with the bishops of Exeter. And this design of this, this lovely doorway of this kind of um, cusped, almost miniature tympana going around the doorway there, each one with a different foliate motif is, um, is unique in uh, the southwest. Um, the Agnes Day, just off centre uh, above the, the inner order of the doorway there, that is a motif that did really land in the southwest. We find that all over the place, at different places, uh, Launceston, Care Hayes, Angelos Carrier, to name but a few. Um, so this is a, a place we can connect uh, quite strongly with the bishops of Exeter. Um, I've thrown in, just to step into my uh, role as ambassador for Cornish tourism, not that it needs it, I've thrown in a, those couple of photos there just to say that if you are ever in that part of the world, this is still the only Romanesque site I've ever been to entirely by boat. You get two ferries, one from Falmouth and then one from Fal uh, St Moore's to place. The second of those two ferries is that one in the picture. It takes eight people. So it is a great uh, bit of field work a day out. This is um, Bishop Stainton uh, in Devon. The clue is in the name. The village was the, summer, um, the residence of uh, the Bishops of Exeter. The uh, summer palace uh, remains there in, in ruins. And this is the west doorway of the church. Um, and it's a standout work in, in the southwest. Uh, these particular beakheads um, are really quite something. Um, highly decorated and unlike any other work in, in the southwest peninsula at all. We have carved columns, we have all kinds of things going on there. There's also a figurative tympanum which is most unusual. And I think the carver here, I think we can safely say likely to be connected to these high status networks of patronage, um, connected to Bishop uh, of Exeter. I think the card at Bishop Stainton may have worked at Down St Mary as well, because this again stands out in the county for being a figurative piece of work, but you know, I think there are some stylistic similarities, these wonderful beasts with these huge uh, luxuriant foliate tails and the um, daisy wheel motif as well. Now, just to sort of uh, show you a bit more of the Bishop Stainton uh, work, there's a, a capital here of such sort of uh, striking singularity that um, I want to sort of head over to the east of the county to Hawke Church uh, and briefly show you the chancel arch capitals there, which have these wonderful stripy uh, worms or uh, dragons on them with the... Uh, Repeated geometric motif above, a daisy wheel, but I'm sure the um, eagle-eyed among you will have noticed the capital to the, uh, just on the left there, shares some considerable uh, similarities to the one at uh, Bishop Stainton. So it's likely that there's some connection in terms of uh, masons and um, masonry workshops, um, although there's a considerable difference in the execution there, but there's, a, there's some kind of replication of an idea. On the whole though, these are sites that stand out uh, in the southwest for being quite different. And so what I want to show you next is really sort of the ambient background for, um, for the southwest. Uh, the sort of the kinds of masonry that you will, uh, the carvings that you will find um, in a lot of the most of the churches will visit. Um, please excuse my very wobbly map uh, of the region. This is just to show you the basic geology. And I think the Romanesque, uh, the Norman Masons really did struggle in the southwest to find good quality carving stone. Um, we have uh, Cataclus stone on the north coast of Cornwall, which is a lovely charcoal green colour, very fine grained. It is an igneous rock is connected to the granite uh, intrusions. 
um, on the south coast there, Penchuan, which is a, a very pale buff coloured stone. Again, it's igneous, it's connected to the granite intrusions as well. Um, Polyphants, which uh, I haven't marked on the map um, for some reason. This is probably why my publisher rejected this uh, sketch map <laughs> before commissioning a, a, an equally sketchy map from someone else. Um, to the north of Bodmin, and I'll show you uh, that in, in a moment. But, and then in Devon we have uh, Beer Stone, which is what a lot of Exeter Cathedral is made for. It's a very fine-grained, chalky limestone, really nice to work. Uh, and then that green strip down the centre there, that's the, the new red sandstones, uh, which you will see in a moment. So these are, the, these are good um, you know, sources of carving stone. But I think this varied geology in the southwest um, is a gift in many respects, because what it does is allow us to explore the close connection between design, motif and stone type. And what this presents us with is a possibility that outside the main uh, building <laughs> projects, such as Exeter or Heartland Abbey or Plimpton Priory, workshops were likely based at or, or, or particular quarries or, or close to particular quarries and churning out highly distinctive runs of particular items. So I'm going to show you some of these now. So if you visit a church in South Devon, before, chances are, before long, you're going to find one of these fonts. There's about 14 of these. Um, Palmet fonts, or as uh, Kate Clark, uh, the writer on Romanesque sculpture in the early years of the 20th century, called them honeysuckle fonts. You'll notice on the slide there I've called them spiky leaf palmets. There's a reason for this in a moment, because there's another kind of palmet which we're going to look at. Now, these were largely written off uh, as being identical. And as you can already see, there's some variety. There's certainly a distinct template being worked here, but there's variety within that as well. And you can certainly see that in the, the poor example at, um, at Buckfast Lee on the right there, which has survived the arson attack in the early 90s, which is why it's in such a terrible state. So we have palmettes. These vary between three leaves, uh, four or five. And then we have these accompany, accompanying geometric decoration of cable twist or the star motif, um, a sawtooth chevron at the base, um, or nothing at all, as we'll see in a few others there, just to give you some more ideas of this kind of work. We find uh, these palmet designs as well in chiefly on fonts, as that's the bulk of the material that has survived. But um, we find, or we did find, <coughs> before it went missing, um, find them being used on this tympanum, uh, which it doesn't look like it's carved in the red sandstone, but it is. It's just covered in a lot of biological growth. This is from a church at Tynmouth originally, and it was moved to Dawlish in the early 1820s when the church was being renovated. Um, the vicar basically took it to put over his garden door and uh, sadly the place was sold um, to the developers and uh, just before it got sold, the department disappeared mysteriously, which is a great shame. Now, there's another thread of, of, uh, of bad stone carvings this evening. I thought it would be a great place to introduce some of them for you. As part of my research into this motif a few years ago, I set myself the challenge of um, carving one of them um, and without copying a, any particular design. I thought, surely I've been spent months looking at them and um, you know, drawing them and all the rest of it. I should be able to just like bash one of these things out because that's surely what these masons are doing. Um, and you know, Okay, it's not bad in places, but you know, I've messed up on the pointedness of the leaves. I forgot the leaf in the middle, so that's an afterthought. Um, and there's something strange about the volutes as well going around. The, the run around doesn't quite work. Uh, and yes, to this day, I'm finished. But what it showed me was that actually there's quite a lot of technical proficiency going on in work that is so, you know, deemed repetitive and um, we tend not to pay too much uh, attention to. So it's a really valuable uh, exercise in that respect. 
Now, these are coupled within uh, that group, which are clearly connected to it in terms of the design template, um, but shows that this particular group of carvers or um, masons connected to the new red sandstone quarries in Torbay were doing other things as well. I mean, the, the one with the big volutes at Lod as well is clearly very similar to the palmettes. You know, they've got the spiral volume, they've got the star motif, and the chevron at the base. The one I particularly like is on the right, and the, the one at Dean Pryor. I like to imagine that this was done by one of the masons who'd done like maybe six or seven of those palmet fonts and it just gone, enough, I'm going to do something different, and was trying out this um, scrolling uh, foliate motif, um, which, you know, is just quite simple incised carving, but it does represent, you know, uh, a step to doing something different there. Um, this particular font, um, again, I'm going to mention Kate Clark. She's one of the few uh, to really go um, to get Romanesque and uh, wrote nine articles between 1913 and 1922, and has really, really set the foundations um, for a lot of work uh, in, in the Southwest. And these are her notes about this particular font. Working with her friend Beatrix Cresswell, who did sketches, field sketches, and uh, Kate Clark did uh, notes and uh, measurements, you know, um, early archaeological recording really, they were able to work out the patterns. And as you can see there, that um, she quickly cottoned on to the fact that they were, it's uh, a foliate band, and this is something that Pevsner, when he went around, and I have no wish to knock Pevsner, I know he wasn't a great fan of the Romanesque in places, um, he identified this as two contorted dragons, so he didn't really look at it um, that closely. Which, of course, then got perpetuated in the literature. So if you go back to, um, back to the early part of the 20th century, they could you know, it's very much uh, foliage motifs. Now, this is what the other type of palm net, so you can see why I've... Um, called the other one spiky leaf palm we only get those on the new red sandstone. On the clear stone, we get these rounded leaf palm And again, there's like nine or ten of these. Different type of font, this sort of uh, tub font with a waist, if you like, and the, the cable mould. Um, and it's a very different kind of palm motif. There's no volutes, uh, and the, the leaves are usually six um, or eight. Going around there. And again, you get that one at Timpanum as well, uh, in the position of a tree of life, if you like. So perhaps it carries over that uh, imagery or, or, and meaning onto the fonts too. I tend to think of these palmet motifs as a Devonian thing because they're, they're quite strong uh, there. As you can see there's a lot of them. Uh, this is the entire, pretty much, um, the entire repertoire of Cornish palmet motifs. And we can see. This doesn't continue on that very clear connection with different stones. We get them across a range of stones. We've got the Cataclou stone there um, at Foy and, and Ladock, and then the Pentuer stone at uh, Langreth, and they're all very different motifs as well. So that one doesn't really land in the southwest. However, the pattern of particular motifs and particular stone type does continue or with um, the Bodmin style fonts, of which this is the one at Bodmin, perhaps the best example from around 1200. This is connected to the Bodmin Priory workshops, um, and it's an absolutely epic scale font, um, very detailed carving uh, of sort of a, a foliate band which sprouts into this great lush foliage at the top, and there's uh, beasts associated with that. Um, which are lions, um, and in some cases, dragons. This does, um, again, get copied a lot, and it's in the same stone, it's in Panchuan stone. If you ignore those columns uh, of, uh, I think, southern time there, or the one at St. Newman East. So this pattern of particular quarries, or workshops associated with particular quarries, particular stones, um, it looks like we have that in Cornwall as well. And another um, set of fonts, the Altenum style fonts, again, there's about nine or ten of these. 
uh, these are called polyphant stone, which is the very dark, kind of soapy, um, textured stone of a big round or in the centre, held in place by a double-headed snake, and on the corner, these uh, bearded heads. So that is, if you like, the ambient uh, background of a lot of the Romanesque carving in the counties. If you photocopy a road map very poorly, <coughs> stick it into a notebook and stick stickers over it, this will tell you a very crucial detail, which is what I've just said, which is if you ignore all my group one, group two stuff there, that was me going off on one, trying to find things that weren't there. Um, the blue dots are the Bodmin fonts, which occur all around the Bodmin area, and uh, where the Penchuan quarries are, and the yellow dots are the Altonan style fonts, and they're all occurring in the east of the county around the Polyphone quarries. So it kind of, you know, the stones didn't travel that far, and the designs seem to stay quite local as well. Right. So what I'd like to do then is talk a bit about repeating patterns and how we've responded to them, how we've historically responded to them, and how this might have impacted upon our understanding and appreciation of the Romanesque in the southwest of England in particular. We're going to leave this up for a moment and uh, for a few minutes and you know, watch as you'll gradually zone out. This is the mass hypnosis section of the evening. <laughs> this is a watercolour of a uh, you know, familiar star motif, uh, which I painted a few years ago, and it's based upon a, a carving which I did a while back again, which we'll get to here in a moment. So becoming a working stonemason gradually started to change my perspective on the historic material. When I started out researching and writing my thesis, um, I was drawn to what I thought at the time was far more engaging uh, and immediate carvings of animals and human figures, and monsters in particular. These images are attention-grabbing, and I think they're meant to be. And to me, at that point, patterns look simple and boring and, well, repetitive. That's where I was, you know, at the time, writing my PhD. But there are reasons for this, I think, and there are reasons why I might have um, had those sort of views. And so I want to see if I can start to rehabilitate um, my eyes, our eyes, so that Romanesque patterns can be a bit more satisfying in terms of what they might give us. So to do that, we do need to look at a few historical uh, forces or, or you know, contexts. Firstly, this idea of replication and repetition. In some of what I've shown you already, we've likely seen both replication of a feature as well as repetition of a feature. So replication is usually a good thing. It's often how we work out um, you know, style and uh, influences and so forth. So like the Bishop Stainton Capital and the one at Bork Church, we can see there's a, a broad connection there in some way. And of course, chances are given the high status uh, connections of Bishop Stainton, it could be Hawk Church one, you know, being copied, or it could be the same Masons working in the east of the county. But there's a, a stylistic link. Repetition, though, as in the Parmet fonts, suggests no singular first, but rather an endless production of similar forms. None are identical, and so not perfect repeats. They're sort of repeats plus, if you like. But then that is the nature of repetition. Ironically, it can never be truly repeated. This means that each one is more uh, unique than they first appear. So unless we're careful, we quickly get caught in a paradoxical position of dismissing these repeated one-offs as somehow less interesting than the more obvious sculptural one-offs. And if something appears too repetitive, then there's a danger that it's interpreted as primitive and lacking in quality. Primitive is conventionally uh, defined in negative terms as lacking in elements such as organisation, technical accomplishment, and refinement. And generally, it's used to refer uh, to something considered less complex or less advanced than something else. But, as I've shown you already this evening, Romanesque patterns and designs seem to have plenty of organisation, and certainly from my own um, attempts to carve some of them, plenty of technical accomplishment as well. So the, really, the key word here is refinement, lacking in refinement. This idea of uh, things lacking in refinement dovetails in some respect with how the Southwest has been 
promoted over the last 200 years or so, particularly Cornwall. As it's been said, the invention and promotion of Cornwall as a tourist destination throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, chiefly to urban professionals, drew upon and developed romanticised notions of the county as, and I quote, a place of retreat, simplicity and innocence peopled by bucolic, smiling villages. <laughs> now, to make it clear, that's not my quote. <laughs> um, there's a font at Tregony, which is the closest I could find really to illustrating sort of slightly smiling, uh, ambiguous heads there. Um, and I think within this kind of uh, conceptual context of wilderness and simplicity at the conventional edges of the land, the idea of the, of the primitive can, can flourish. And I think perhaps the Romanesque in Cornwall, perhaps more than in any other county, draws out these assumptions um, in, a, in a rugged landscape. We expect a primitive art, perhaps. Added to this is this idea of the, the fragments or the fragmentary. As I mentioned at the start, much of the Romanesque in, in, the, far, in, in the far southwest is, um, you know, is fragments. There's a bit here, there's a doorway there, there's a font somewhere else, or, or a fragment of a carved piece. Um, somewhere else. As um, sculptors such as Rodin and Moore have pointed out, I'm sure many others too, fragments are a special case in sculpture for they point toward the whole and in doing so they invite us to finish it with our imaginations, thereby becoming a participant in its finishing. So when sculptors talk about the dynamic potential of the unfinished, this is what they're referring to, fragmentary work sparking uh, the mind and creating this kind of link, this connection between the work and the viewer. And certainly sculptors such as Rodin and Moore worked hard to make unfinished sculptures in which absent parts were somehow integral to the present form. Um, and indeed Rodin, the great modernist, was a huge fan of medieval cathedrals as we can see from his book Cathedrals of France where he tried to um, represent medieval uh, uh, Romanesque and Gothic work to a different audience uh, to try and, as you can see from that quote there, to rescue it um, for the future, which is, you know, a wonderful, grand claim. But I return to craft processes which have kind of woven their way through this. And I'm sure, ultimately, as I'm sure many of you are already thinking, Perhaps what is really playing out here is the old art versus craft dilemma, or fine art versus decorative art, with decorative art somehow being lesser than true art, the art of the genius. And it's true, in the broader scheme of things, imagery that's considered repetitive has rarely been accorded much praise. And this view has been perpetuated and maintained by circular arguments that seem to reinforce themselves. Decorative art is repetitive, and therefore provides no opportunity for individual expression. Um, this precludes originality, often regarded as the criterion for quality. So decorative art then, by its very nature, cannot be original, and therefore cannot be of any quality. Further, ornament is um, immediate and dazzling, and bypasses sometimes intellectual processing. You know, we respond to it. Um, and there's a sort of implied class aspect here too, uh, of masons not quite understanding what they're carving, of masons being childish, and certainly throughout the 20th century, um, a lot of work, uh, a lot of architectural sculpture was written about, the masons didn't quite know what they were doing, they were just having a joke and getting away with things. Of course, we know that carving stone costs money, nobody was getting away with anything. You can't get away with things at cathedrals, believe me. Um, so I think that we tend to think of repetition as sameness and standardisation which has come from industrial processes perhaps or from modernity in any number of cultural forms and certainly repeated forms might well be thought of as mechanical and unfulfilling and perhaps they are when they're done by a machine but of course Romanesque repetition is not that it's not standard in fact no two elements are carved uh, or, or in a, an identical way, or, or come out in an identical way. Repetition of difference is something that the French philosopher 
Gilles Deleuze wrote about, and he has a much more poetic phrase than me. He says, each repetition contains its own uniqueness. I take that as a recognition of difference within the sameness. And this is something that I've discovered in a practical way by stonemasonry rather than uh, philosophy. Now, I'm sure you'll be glad to know this is the last of my own stone carvings I'm going to show you this evening. Um, if you look closely at this, again, a star motif on uh, Irish limestone, you can see, once you get your eye into it, that all of these stars are rectangles and not squares. Is this a mistake of setting out? Well, perhaps it is. Um, but, again, what this showed me was that there is great variation within things that, at first glance, might not appear to have any variation within them whatsoever. And these differences between, um, certainly if you look at the left-hand side, you'll see they're much more rectangular there um, than they are throughout the rest of the stone. It's differences such as this which I think give a lot of Romanesque work its life. And of course this is you know, variation and asymmetry is where we cross over into the territory of the mistake, which is something else I'm very interested in, um, and certainly mistakes, historic mistakes by stonemasons. I love finding them uh, looking around old buildings. But this is where things get interesting, I think. Things that are difficult to carve are often the same things that have historically been labelled primitive. This isn't always the case, but primitive can in fact be quite difficult. It's certainly more difficult to hide your mistakes on flat surfaces and clear planes than it is among much more flowery, detailed work, I think. And this is because the shapes and the forms are quite clear, and perhaps this is one reason why Romanesque did get picked up so strongly by modernist artists. For example, John Piper, and this is one of his photographs. I'm sure you're all aware of the uh, Piper archive at the Tate. Um, this is a man who thought nothing of driving through the night to show people a font, um, often surprising church wardens at 10 in the morning by having been sat in a graveyard all night waiting for them to open the church. But this is um, one of his collections. Again, it's the font of Tregony. There's a ghostly hand to one side, you may notice that, who's holding up a, a large bit of black cloth. Um, I think that's possibly his wife from a family to block out the light of the uh, windows coming in behind to get a good photograph. And again, of course, Piper did a lot to rescue the Romanesque in lots of ways. Um, England's early sculptors being one of them in the Architectural Review from 1936. So I do wonder whether it would be helpful if we thought about repeated forms in Romanesque as a kind of a, a different sameness to extract them from the another chevron part of our brain to see them as a bit more um, significant in themselves. So with that in mind, I'd like to look at some doorways in North Devon that have sometimes been dismissed as identical, but in fact show a number of differences. And in pursuing both the differences and the samenesses, it's possible, I think, to extract some more information from them. So, these are the ones I'd like to have a, a look at and to um, look at in a bit more detail. These are um, doorways at Shevier, Walsery, Upland Brewer and Parkham, which have often been uh, written, well, not, say often been written about, they haven't often been written about, but when they have cropped up in Literature, by literature, I tend to mean guidebooks and uh, general guides to the area um, or general books on churches in, in Devon. The word that has been used about them is identical. Now, Parkham, the one on the lower right, is a slightly different uh, beast in this in that it doesn't have big heads around it, but it does have the other motifs. And, I mean, identical isn't a bad word. They are remarkably repetitive. There's four different types of beak head. One, you know, one beak, two types of animal head, and one male head with a moustache. Um, they have this inner order of this triple chevron, this outer order of a, a split uh, cylinder motif, and then there's these big, heavy spiral volutes, and um, 
interlaced uh, semicircles as well. So they do kind of look like they've been made on a production line to some degree. Now I first got interested in these from this map, and this goes back to when I was researching my PhD. This map absolutely enthralled me because, I mean, I'm sure it was meant to um, sort of uh, say, look, look at Yorkshire, look at Oxfordshire, but immediately to me, the bit that stood out was the southwest. And it stood out because what are those doorways doing there in, on the north coast? That one underneath, 31, that is Bishop Stainton. We've seen that one already. So we can already see how unusual these are in the uh, southwest of England. So this really intrigued me. Fortunately, soon after PhD, I moved to North Devon, so they were on the doorstep. Uh, and this is just to give you a, a close-up of one of them. And we can see uh, those chevrons, big heads, uh, that outer motif, which is like a a split kind of cylinder, with, you know, or kind of makes butterfly wings, if you like. Um, if there is an exact name for this motif, I'm sure I'm in the right place for somebody to tell me, but um, I don't know it at the moment. And capitals with these huge volutes and interlaced uh, semicircles on the abacus there as well. Now, that's the North Devon work. But included within these doorways are two other ones in Cornwall, which are key to understanding them. Again, they've all been lumped together as being very similar, but they're not. This is the south door at Kilcampton on the north coast of Cornwall, and it is absolutely enormous. It's in a small village, and the church is nothing particularly grand about it other than this uh, phenomenal doorway. In many respects, it's second, you know, if we can rank these things, it's second in the county to the huge doorway at St. Germans. So what is this vast doorway of multiple, multiple chevrons doing in a very small um, village on the north coast? We need to look at another one, six miles north of Kilcampton, and that's at Morwenstow. Again, this is one of those slides which I've included to do my bit for Cornish tourism, uh, which they won't thank me for. It's impossible to photograph this church without a crow flying above the tower. I've never managed to do it myself. Um, the south door here has been split into two. The outer arc now forms the outer uh, part of the doorway around the porch, and there's the original inner uh, which forms the doorway um, there. But we can see it's very similar to the Kilcampton doorway. We've got the beak heads, which are identical on the inner order, and then we have multiple varieties of chevron, uh, frontal and lateral ones uh, going around above that. So quite different from the North Devon ones. And there are other similarities between the two, such as the capitals to the east of the south door. We've got these uh, very pine cone like hop motifs on them. So the two are quite strongly linked. If we go inside Morwenstow, we're faced with this incredible north nave arcade uh, with these Romanesque uh, arches and all kinds of interesting things going on. Here's a close up of one of them. And already, I'm sure you can recognise, hang on a minute. These look very similar to uh, the North Devon doorways. They have that flat kind of triple chevron on the inner, um, that particular motif going around the outside. Um, we've got this particular one looks like the one at Parkham with the single head and the roll moulding. Um, but you know, we can see those beak heads there. There's a close up of them and a, and a closer shot of, uh, of the other arch there. Um, with the volutes, interlaced semicircles, hexafoil, daisy wheel designs, all some of the key motifs of uh, the North Devon group. And again, just to show just to show you how close things are, we have um, Walsbury and Parkham there from the North Devon uh, doorways and more into there itself, just to show you the little heads replicated within the interlaced semicircles on the top of the capital. 
there is that capital in close-up. Quite a phenomenal thing, I think. And there are similarities there with Heartland. Um, the font at Heartland, formerly in Heartland Abbey, um, interlaced semicircles being the key motif all over that, and chevrons on the, um, on the pedestal. Now, I'm sure I don't need to explain to an audience such as yourselves the main uh, way of expanding a medieval church in the, medi um, in the you know, uh, Romanesque, early Gothic period, and, and indeed later periods, just to extend it by building out an aisle. Um, here is a really clear plan from Tortington in Sussex of a two-celled Romanesque church has been expanded by the addition of an aisle. So I think this is what's happened at Morwenstow. We've had the original build of a small church with the south doorway. Then we've had uh, a later addition of an aisle. That's when that north nave arcade has gone in. So we actually have two phases of Romanesque uh, work at Morwenstow. And that's what links the Cornish doorways, the Kilcampton Morwenstow doorway, with the North Devon uh, doorways. Here I'm going to refer to you, Ron. This is a quote that has uh, really helped me in uh, my research into this. You know, again, it comes back to that map of why are these beakheads in that particular part of the world. There's, you know, there's nothing else around them. And uh, it's this close link. Well, the link with Henry I, I think, is very uh, crucial as well. It comes out in a moment. But it's this unsuspected links of patronage or emulation that can throw up rich displays in counties otherwise lacking in the motif. This really started to um, help me think about what they're doing there. Why are they all suddenly there? You know, particularly these, that spectacular doorway at Kilcampton. I think we do have a patron in the offing that can be placed right in the midst, and that is Robert of Gloucester. Not only eldest illegitimate son of Henry I, Earl of Gloucester from 1122 on, but a great patron of the arts as well. Um, many manuscripts dedicated to him, but also he had a keen architectural eye and, and, and an interest, so established Priory, Priory of St. James at Bristol. Crucially, though, I'm sure you've read ahead of me there, he held the manor of Kilcampton, so there's a close link there. And the church of Kilcampton is dedicated to St. James as well, as the Priory of St. James in Bristol, so I do wonder whether it was on um, a sea, uh, a waterway, uh, pilgrimage route as well. So in many respects, a king in all but name is certainly well placed to be um, commissioning high status architectural works. This is Hartland Abbey. This is another thing we need to take account of in this period, this sort of late Romanesque period. Sadly, nothing Romanesque survives at Hartland now. Um, this is all later work, but it would have been a huge building project at the time. So I think if we put all that together, what we have is a slight chronology. We have Robert of Gloucester potentially introducing the beakhead motif uh, to Kilcampton in that uh, huge doorway. There's that link, uh, close links with Morwenstow stylistically. There's Morwenstow South Door. I think that would have gone up by a similar team of masons. Then we have Heartland Abbey being re-established, which, as I've just said, would have been a major building project. And then we have the, the uh, church at Morwenstow being expanded by the addition of an aisle. And so we have a second Romanesque period going in. And that correlates with the North Devon doorways of the 1160s and 1180s. Um, so possibly stonemasons working out of or connected to Heartland Abbey. Um, working on that north aisle at Morwenstow. So just to return then, and to conclude, to where we started uh, with the, the arch at Shebia, hopefully some, to some degree we managed to rehabilitate the power of repeating patterns and motifs this evening, if only in a very small way. Far from being written off as identical or repetitive, I think there's a wealth of information here that we can really dig in and extract, and that repays much as well. 
I think that trying to understand repetition as a, res as a resource is a crucial tool in our toolkit. And perhaps um, both repetition and ordinary motifs can direct us towards a better understanding of patrons and, and masonry workshops, and in this way help us to see doorways that have been sidelined or written off in the past as having uh, much more to offer than they have done to date. Thank you very much. Thank you.